scratched the surface is the nothing personal word of the day. It's Monday, August 29th, 2022. And we've got quite a bit to get to, but we're starting with Julio Rodriguez and scratching the surface. Scratching the surface means that you believe you have found gold, diamonds in the rough where you take it out of the ground and you see little dirt, but you say, oh, there must be something great under here, like a frickin' iceberg. Scratching the surface is when you sign a player and you think you've gotten the best deal because you're underpaying him because he's gonna outperform the deal because you know something that no one else knows. You know that he's only scratched the surface of his talent, of his skill, but when in reality, what the deals are these days, there's no scratching the surface. You've gotten right down to the core. We're talking about the Seattle Mariners player, the 21-year-old Julio Rodriguez, who has played 108 games. Now it's 109, but 108 games, or 110, whatever. After 108 games, four, six, nine. After 108 games, that's it. That's not even a full year. He's a rookie. The Seattle Mariners made an announcement on Friday where I looked and I said, this can't be true. Are you telling me that the Seattle Mariners, wait for it, are giving him an 18-year, $470 million deal? They're going to pay him till he's 39 years old. That's it. Breaking news. Get on CBS. Let's go. $470 million blows away Mike Trout. Huh? This can't be. I'm missing something for sure. Let's get details. So a statement comes out from Jerry Depoto, the GM, talking about how he's just scratched the surface, how he's the face of the franchise, how great it is. And I was laughing because it was the same weekend that they were retiring. They didn't retire Ichiro's number. They elected Ichiro into the Mariners Hall of Fame. And Ichiro brought Edgar Martinez and Jamie Moyer and Ken Griffey Jr. Faces of the franchise, you could argue. I didn't see A-Rod there. But, or Randy Johnson, though he could have been. So Ichiro, when he came to the Mariners, had a track record in Japan and had a career with the Mariners that will end up in Cooperstown, though, of course... According to the video they did for him, Coca, you know, they didn't even put the Yankees or the Marlins in the video. So they showed like his 1,000th hit, his 2,000th hit. Why not show his 3,000th hit? Oh my God, it's in another uniform. Who cares? Are you doing a career retrospective? Or maybe you're just doing a retrospective of the Mariners. The odds of Julio Rodriguez being Ichiro, I don't know, one in a thousand. The odds of him being Ken Griffey Jr., wait for it. One in a gazillion. What teams are doing now by signing these players to these contracts when they're so young is they're saying to you, we're getting cost certainty. We are wrapping up a player before free agent contracts get even larger, before the average annual value for a guy who's 28 becoming a free agent is 50 million or 60 million or 70 million. Do I hear 80 million? And we're getting him for way under that. This is brilliant. The odds of knowing whether a player in his first year is going to be Ichiro or Chris Coughlin or any number of other rookies of the year who are fine. They won rookies of the year, but they certainly were not Hall of Fame worthy. They certainly were not the best players on their team ever again. The odds of getting it right are under 10%. Anecdotally, I'm going to say 8%, 1%. Yeah, Cunha signed for eight years, $100 million, and so far he's won an MVP, and it seems like a great deal for the Braves. Absolutely. But how about Wander Franco? That was only last year. That player for the Tampa Bay Rays, remember him? He finished like third rookie of the year. He was the next big thing. He could do it all. He had seven tools out of only five, right? Not only could he run and hit and throw, he hit for power. But in addition, he had like Superman powers. I don't know, maybe you could see he was invisible or something. He signed that, uh, that deal that was 11 years, $182 million. That was the record for a player with under two years of service. He hasn't played since July 9th. Now you're gonna say, David, that's one season. What's the big deal? He broke his wrist, it was unlucky. He doesn't have a chronic injury. But here's how it works in Major League Baseball. And everybody forgets it when they announce it. Julio Rodriguez, 
and Wander Franco and Acuna and Tatis, all of them, when you become a major leaguer, the rules are you already have a six-year contract. We don't know what the player is going to be paid, but he is under control as the term, meaning he is a member of that team, unless he gets traded or released or designated for assignment, but he's a member of that team. Julio Rodriguez already has a six-year blank contract with the Mariners. The way you decide what a player gets paid, go back and listen to past episodes where I talk about arbitration. Arbitration is where you have to compare yourself to other players who have accomplished what you have accomplished in numbers, not in fame, not in how nice you are, not in being the face of the franchise or scratching the surface or in potential. What have you done? How many games have you played? How many home runs have you hit? What's on your, you're on base, you're slugging. Now, let's look at comps. Arbitration use comps, not contract comps. You look for player comps, and then you see what those players get paid. You don't say, oh, I wanna make $15 million. Let me just talk about all the players who've made $15 million. Fantastic. I've been in arbitration rooms where players have done that. I had fun with Cody Ross when he did that, comparing himself to players who made more money. Love you, Cody. It's about what you've done. Wander Franco doesn't have to do anything. And as a first year arbitration player under his guaranteed contract signed last year, he'll make $8 million. Go back and look at Miguel, what Miguel Cabrera got paid or Dontro Willis got paid in their first year of arbitration. Go back and look at Aaron Judge and see what he got paid in his first year of arbitration. You need bulk and you need historic performance. Wander Franco's already missed two months of a season. We get to use that in arbitration to depress the salary of the player in his first year of arbitration. Hey, he did not play for two months in his second year. When you guarantee player contracts, none of that becomes relevant anymore. But it doesn't mean that you have the player for longer. It just means no matter what the player does, injured, lack of performance, he still gets that money. So Wander Franco is still gonna get his $8 million. Then in the second year of Franco's deal, by the way, he went to $15 million. That means he's gotta be really good the year of his, that he gets the 8 million. You don't just go from eight to 15 by showing up and playing 162 and hitting 210 or 240. You actually have to perform no more. So the Mariners came out and said, face the franchise, we've locked him up. He was already locked up for six. And then it was announced that he got $470 million. And I said to myself, no chance, toilet pants. Sometimes I say that out loud, but I actually say that inside my own head because that seems unrealistic that this guy with 20 home runs, 23 stolen bases, second in the home run derby, all the things that he's done that make people say, my God, this is the next best player. Scouts do that to me all the time. Hey, you gotta have this guy. I've never seen, this is it. They say this, ready? put this in air quotes, a generational talent. According to my son, generations now are labeled every 15 years, right? There's generation, maybe it's Z right now and X and K and Y and J and E and L and L and Y, whatever the generations are named, I have no idea what they're named, but whatever, 15 years. So when a scout says to me, this is a generational talent, I'll say, wow, we're never gonna see anything like him for 15 years. You better not come back to me. Don't come back to me next year with the next generational talent. And as sure as the sun rises in the east, the next year is the next guy. Oh my God, David, we found him. This guy is a generational talent. What about the guy from last year? Oh, this guy's better. To make $470 million, Julio Rodriguez has to do the following. It's pretty simple. He has to win two MVPs or finish in the top five four times in his first eight years. Hmm. Trying to think who finished in the top five four years. Let me think. Mike Trout is my guess. I bet he's been in the top five. I wonder whether Mookie Betts has been in the top five four times in his first eight years. Maybe Tim Lincecum. He had a good start. Buster Posey. He had a good start to his career. Let's get a list, Coca. He can't do it now because I just thought of this. I'm just curious about the number of people who finish in the top five four times or who win two MVPs. 
in their first eight years. And if that happens, then the team has an option after year eight to sign him to a 10-year, $350 million contract. Yes, the Julio Rodriguez contract is an eight-year contract. That's it. Guess what? Six of the years were what it was anyway, as I just told you. So they just extended him for two extra years. Now, they have an option on him. Why do they have that option? The reason they have that option is that they gave him $15 million now. If we ran a team that had $15 million in extra cash, which we didn't, but if we did, you throw that around to players, it is a brilliant, brilliant thing. Wow, Mike Trout was in the top five every year of his first nine years. Okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else? Hey, Julio Rodriguez is Mike Trout, for sure, and they know it now after 108 games. That's how good he is. Listen, I guess there's a good chance, very good chance. Julio Rodriguez is Mike Trout. Fair enough. Okay, so... We were talking about something before you yelled in my ear about Mike Trout, and I don't know what it was, but it was decent. Should we play it back? I wish we were like a jury trial where we could say, hey, can you read back the record, please? I don't have the first notion what was in my head because, poof, it's gone. It'll come back to me. It'll come back to me, I promise you. So my summation of Julio Rodriguez is that it's the eight years where he's guaranteed. Then the team has the option to pick up a 10-year, $350 million deal. But wait a minute. What if he doesn't win two MVPs or finish in the top five four times? Well, there's another one. What if he finishes in the top 10 four times? Just the top 10. Ah, then it's an eight-year extension for $260 million. So 260 plus the original contract, um, that doesn't get him to 470. Why is it always reported the maximum? Remember when we did Patrick Mahomes' contract and everyone was just aghast at how much money he was gonna make? And I told you that if you read the contract, which was reported, he has to win like Super Bowl MVP every year or league MVP every year in order to get the highest of his escalators. These are just escalators that I would love to put in contracts, except I wouldn't like to put in MVP of the league. I want World Series MVP. Like the Chiefs putting in Super Bowl MVP is brilliant because if the Chiefs win the Super Bowl every year and Mahomes is your quarterback, bang, bang, boom, pay him whatever he wants. If the Mariners are winning World Series, I am more than happy to give him $470 million over the course of his life. No problem. Oh, we were talking about the $15 million. I told you I'd get you there. What players do is when they are offered an amount of money that is life-changing and their family does not have money, we know exactly how much money the family has because we visit them when we sign them and we understand what their life is like. And that is why, for example, Fernando Tatis, who had family money, or other players, other sons of major league players when there is money in that family or money because they're ranchers or farmers, whatever, whatever businessmen, like maybe the head of Wall Street has a child play major league baseball. They don't wanna take extra money up front to sacrifice money down the road because their view is we're okay. Julio Rodriguez got $15 million. When you say that to him, he says, oh my God, I would have only made a million dollars. That's the league minimum. Next year, I only would have made a million dollars. That's the league minimum. Next year, I only would have made a million dollars. That's the league minimum. Three years of that. So he could have had $3 million after three years. And now he got $15 million today. That's it. Pay taxes on that. Let's just take 50% away. Let's just say you're at $7.5 million. Guess what? His family has a house. He has a house. He's got two cars, bit of jewelry, and your GTG. Good to go. Now, why would agents push their players to do this? I want to give you a quote by Julio Rodriguez's agent who was not on the map before and now he is. And here it goes, because you're going to be very happy with this. Scott Boris is looking at this quote and he's smiling. He's getting a significant amount of guaranteed money, said the agent. This was not the goal but it turns out to be the most amount of guaranteed money before two years of service. <laughs> Do you know what agents tell their players in order to get more players? They say, hey, I'm gonna break the record for you. That's what Boras has done his whole career. He just says he's gonna break records. 
He said, I'm going to get you the most money per year, the most money total, or the most money for a first baseman who hits from the left side who's age 28. That's how much he breaks it down because he gets to say he has a record, and then he gets to tell a player, the player gets to tell his teammates, and then he tries to get more clients that way. You think the agent was not aware what the record was for a contract for a player with under two years of service? GMAB. Of course it's the goal. Of course he had knowledge of it. It's absolute horse hockey. So you must be thinking, why is David so against this contract? And my answer is I'm not against it. Don't misunderstand. I just want to make sure that you you are in full knowledge. You have full knowledge of what exactly took place and the risk inherent for the organization. Jerry Depoto, the GM, doesn't have risk. He's not going to be the GM in 14 years, as you know. It just doesn't work that way. I guess if you're Brian Cashman, but it is very, very unlikely. Certainly, Jerry Depoto won't do it, even with the Mariners making the playoffs. But And the owner says, this is great. This, I've, I've, got, I've got a great announcement. There's great momentum. We're about to make the playoffs for the first time and end the longest drought in all four professional sports. They have like a 90% chance of making the playoffs. They've been playing great as we predicted before the season and as they were the most disappointing team when I recorded my all-star break show and now they've played great and they're going to make the playoffs. And then the owner says, of course, let's sign them. Let's show our fans that we're committed. We've got the new face of the franchise. We're moving the team to Julio Rodriguez. Why him? Why now? You didn't need to do it today. But they did. We're going to follow this contract every single year, Coca. We're going to follow the Wander Franco contract, and we're going to find out whether or not, in fact, these teams have made good decisions. I've got a prediction. <laughs> yeah, they've scratched the surface, all right, of his bank account. All right, last night at midnight, something happened, and I put it right in the show. It was not in the show when we did our call yesterday. It was when we did our call this morning. Have you heard the news? This may be breaking news for you. Big news. Minor league players may become part of the Major League Players Association. OMG, this is amazing. Totally awesome, dude. The minor league players are going to unionize? <gasps> Let me give you some details because this happens to be huge news. MLBPA, which is led by Tony Clark, they have said, how about now? This is the time. All of the things that you've read, we've done a bunch of segments on minor league players. Their housing was bad, so baseball said, we're going to take care. We're going to provide housing for everyone. The food was bad. Don't you worry. No more quarter pounders for you. Their wage was bad. Don't you worry. We're increasing your pay by $100. Congratulations. Have fun at P.F. Chang's. But it's been a huge conversation. There's advocate groups. Remember when MLB contracted a bunch of minor league teams? They didn't really contract them. They just became unaffiliated. And how what a big deal that was. Do you know this process began years ago when Rob Manford created One Baseball, which I was completely in favor of. And the reason is I want the commissioner and us as, oh, by the way, that's a dollar fine, Coca. When uh, it's not us, it's them. It was us, now it's them. I want them to have full control over their business. I am in favor of business owners being able to control their business because they're in the best position to decide what is right for the business. Sometimes it's gonna work out for labor, sometimes it's not. But when it does, it does. But it's our job, and I, like it's me with nothing personal. I know it's good for nothing personal. I talk about it with Coca, and we together make a decision of what's good, what's bad, when it's good to do what. When people force you into a decision or force you to do something that you don't want to do, and you are the owner of a business, what do you do? Let me draw your attention to COVID-19. Do you remember when all these companies had to clean extra special? They didn't really do it, but they said they did. Like when you go on a plane or you go into your office or you go in anywhere, there's, we have cleaned this very well. We have wiped everything down. It's, by the way, when they turn around planes these days, believe me, there's no COVID cleaning. But back when it first started, 
Do you remember there was something that you may not have known about called a COVID-19 surcharge? Hmm. They had increased expenses and they didn't want to change their bottom line profits. So they passed along the increased expense to you. When else does that happen? Do you have any recollection when fuel prices got so large? This summer, they're back down now, but fuel went up. Ever heard of a fuel surcharge for your delivery people like Uber Eats? Hey, there's a supply chain issue with groceries. Have you been to the grocery store recently? I can't tell you what a quart of milk is. Don't drink it. Mikey doesn't like it. I think it's because I was forced to have a glass of milk every day as a kid and I hated it and I would pretend to drink it and when my mother would turn around, I'd pour it down the drain. I wasn't a put food in napkin guy because the, the cloth, when I had paper napkins, I would, but cloth napkins, that's just disgusting. And then what do you do? You have to make it to the sink or a garbage can without being seen. It's way too difficult. I would move my food around the plate like the vegetables. I'd cut up the Brussels sprouts into small pieces and put them in different places, put them under like, oh, I got too much chicken today. Fuel surcharge is what happens when the fuel goes up and you pay a fuel surcharge because the airlines or the car companies or the delivery people don't want to lose money. So you pay. Cost of food goes up. Cost of transportation goes up. You go to the grocery store, you pay. Business owners have a funny way of passing on increased expenses. They call it surcharges and then they just bake it into the price. So here's what happened last night. Tony Clark, the head of the Major League Players Association, said, we are going to invite the minor league players to join our union. Here's how this works. Every single minor league player gets a card. It's like fill in the blank card. Do you want to be represented by the Major League Players Association? Right, it's a, it's a, card that that indicates interest 30 percent of the members of minor league baseball 30 percent of the players today have to sign that card then if they get that two things happen they either go to major league baseball and say look look at all these minor league players look at all these employees who want to unionize would you like to recognize them as a union would you like to allow them into the major league baseball players association and MLB is going to say, um, no, thank you. Thanks for the offer, though. Then you bring the card to the NLRB and to people who certify that this is a class of people that is eligible to vote to become part of a union. If that happens, you then take another vote. And this vote's a little different. This vote is by voting yes, you are agreeing not just to become a member of the union, but all of the rights and obligations of being a member of that union. Ever heard of something called union dues? There's also some union don'ts. Like when there's a lockout, that means you're locked out too, even though you're not making as much money and they don't really care about the rank and file, but you're paying your dues every year, which means that the budget for the Major League Players Association is going to skyrocket. Skyrockets will be in flight. When we built Marlins Park, one of the things we had to do was offer the ability for certain workers to unionize, like what's going on in Starbucks where they're trying to unionize, where the workers at Starbucks, the baristas are trying to unionize. You know what's going to happen? News alert for all of the people who are pro-union. What I've always told you about minor leaguers which no one wanted to hear, which is 90% of them stink and are never gonna become major leaguers, and they're just getting to play professional baseball and get paid whatever they're paid and to show up and put on a uniform and play a kid's game as an adult, and oh my God, they have to get winter jobs. You're damn right they do because they're not making enough money. Ever heard of other people who've grown up in households where the parents have to have two jobs or both parents are working? make ends meet, figure out what to do. Oh my God, I've got a family. I need a bigger housing from the team. I'm sorry. When you go and get a job at a company, do you, do you get to say like when you join CBS, Coca, did you get to do this? 
New Jersey CBS, listen, I got to make more money. I've got a wife and three children. I mean, Coco doesn't have that, but CBS would say, great, have fun, good luck. Nope, this is your position. You're the manager of, of whatever you are. This is how much you're going to get paid. Oh, my God, minor league players with families, they need to have bigger, better housing. Where does that have? I'm not sure where that's written, why that has to be. But these minor league players who have no chance to be major league players as president of a major league baseball team, this is a very easy solution. And we are not in any way worried. God damn it, that is two fines in one show. They are not worried at all. MLB did not comment on what's happening because they don't need to because actions speak way louder than words. Here's what's going to happen. Goodbye, minor league baseball. Goodbye, teams in about 60 more cities. Hello, only two teams per major league team. So there'll be 60 minor league teams at most. Goodbye, fringe prospects. Oh, you want to be part of the union? No problem. Have fun in your career. Good luck in your future endeavors. Minor league baseball will cease to exist the way it does, and major league baseball doesn't have to ask anyone. There's no minor league baseball organization anymore. It's all run by major league baseball. Finally, they can decide exactly what they want to do. You want to unionize if you're Starbucks? Great. We're closing down half the stores. Have fun being a barista at Cup of Joe. Why would the Major League Players Association want to get more members? Because they get a higher operating budget. Of course, Tony Clark has to say it in a different way. He has to say this is the exact time when baseball is worried about its antitrust exemption, when everyone has been complaining about their working conditions and living conditions. Now you can join our brotherhood. Okay. Do you think Tony Clark gives a flying rat's ass about the minor league players who are not going to become major league players who are part of the union and then are released by the organization? Which, by the way, happens every year. We release players who just stink because you only need 25 per team and you've got five teams. Do you think Tony Clark's going to be devastated when major league baseball has two minor league teams each and that's it? Nah, he's good. You think that all these people care so much about all the minor league players? No. There's a lot of time left for this. A lot of votes have to happen. We're not allowed as management. There's some rules here. We couldn't go up to the workers, like the concession workers, and say, don't you do this. If you unionize, you're going to be fired. Not allowed to do that. But we're sure as hell allowed to fire them once it's done. <laughs> oh, my God. Can you imagine... The Major League Baseball Players Association. I was just thinking about this. I was going to move on to the next segment. But can you imagine? They send a document to uh, MLB and say, listen, we, we, we would like to know if you'd be willing to certify this union and recognize this union. Would, would, do you mind? Are you in? <laughs> I can picture Rob in his office with Dan Hallam and Chris Marinak and Mike Hill, and they're sitting around. Hey, what's for lunch? <laughs> All right, when we come back, we are going to review I finally got to watch Top Gun, and then we're going to revisit the Josh Hader trade because what happened yesterday was staggering. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. Hope you had a good weekend. I am here off-site moving my son into college for his second year. I don't really understand that. No one ever moved me into college. I don't really want to schlep boxes and go to Bed Bath & Beyond four times. But you do it because you feel like you have to be a good father and you have to, you're totally involved, you're engaged, you want to be a part of it. I want to spend as much time with my son as possible, but I'd rather go to a bar or something or go hang out or go to a movie. What am I, like a mover? Anyway, I'm here. It's always fun to be on a college campus. God, everyone looks so young though. Top Gun Maverick came out streaming, watched it. For all of you who have seen Top Gun Maverick, for all of you who have not, I think you'll know where I'm going with this, but I'm going to throw you a bit of a curveball today. I went into Top Gun Maverick. I didn't see it in the theater because didn't need to, didn't want to. I went in assuming I was going to hate it. 
I love the original Top Gun, but we, don't screw with something perfect. Love Jennifer Connelly. You know Tom Cruise to me, his movies from Mission Impossible to Vanilla Sky to Jerry Maguire to The Firm. I mean, I could go through his whole filmography, find me a better action star, find me a better actor. And I don't mean like Academy Award type Daniel Day-Lewis. He is just as good on the screen as ridiculous off the screen. And I don't really care about his personal life. I don't care about Scientology. I don't care about his sham marriages. I don't care about any of that stuff. Doesn't matter. I want to be entertained. I was prepared to not be entertained either mentally, physically, in any possible way. The movie starts and it looks like they're just sort of doing callbacks to Top Gun 1. All the characters, it's the son of Goose. It's the another good looking bad guy who is one of the guys in Top Gun. Instead of Tom Skerritt, who I loved, you've got John Hamm. So it's like they just replaced every character. So I'm watching the first 30 minutes and I'm looking at Tom Cruise and I'm thinking, you know, this is too much, right? Time passes and you've gotta be okay with that. The last hour of Top Gun Maverick, I'm at the edge of my couch, surround sound happening. There was a story, there was a script, there was meticulously filmed and executed action scenes. There was emotion, passion, predictability, but I got through it. And when the credits rolled, I said, holy crap, that may be the best sequel I've seen in two decades. Top Gun Maverick, go see it. Now, if you haven't seen the first Top Gun, you don't have to see it in order to watch the second Top Gun, but it's sort of, it's, so it's not, it, it's important, but not critical, but go see the first Top Gun and you're gonna say, my God, the fight, fighter, the, 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 four, six, nine. When you go see the first Top Gun, you're gonna say, my God, the fighter scenes, the fighter pilot scenes are not as good, they don't look as good. Obviously, it's an older movie, but it's still amazing. And then watch Top Gun Maverick. Okay. Coco, we got to move on to the the hater trade. I'm not taking a victory lap. People are asking me whether I'm going to take a victory lap because me and Levitard actually off air got into an argument about this. And I can't remember whether it was on air or whether he just talked about it on air, but it's become a thing with Levitard, who I just spoke to yesterday also about this. And he's still not willing to acknowledge wrongdoing because that's how he rolls. Why would he ever acknowledge being wrong about anything when you don't need to be wrong, when you've never been wrong until now. When the Brewers traded Josh Hader, everyone was a hater of the Brewers, right? David Stern doesn't know what he's doing, the president of baseball operations. You have screwed your 2022. You've gotten worse. The clubhouse was angry. Christian Yelich was pouty. Everyone was annoyed. And then the Brewers started losing games, losing games. And coincidentally, the Cardinals didn't lose a game. The Cardinals were in second place. Now they're in first place by like five and a half games. Although it's either five or six. Did the Cardinals beat the Braves last night? If the Cardinals did it, six games. So the Cardinals are now up six. So Josh Hader was traded by the Brewers because he was making so much money that when you're a team like the Brewers and you're a middle market team that's been in the playoffs for four straight years, you've got to churn the roster, folks. And you've got to have a good front office, which is what they have. And you've got to think about tomorrow, not today, if you want to be a team that keeps your window open for as long as possible. You've got to be better than I ever was. You've got to be willing to take public heat because you're doing what's right and then you are right. And you've got to find a sucker like A.J. Preller, who the GM of the Padres. If you can do all of that, you do it. The Brewers got Trevor Rogers, but David, he's out for the year. What a disaster. The Brewers have lost 14 of their 20, last 23 games. They may not even make the playoffs, the odds are. They're only like two games behind the Padres, I think, for the last playoff spot, by the way. But it's, a, it's terrible. We were right. Josh Hader's the best. Josh Hader didn't give up a run until June. Josh Hader has a 25 ERA with the Padres. He can't get anyone out. He's not even the closer anymore. He's given up three or more earned runs three times since he got traded to the Padres. I'm just asking a very quick question. 
if you're the Brewers, are you less angry, the same angry, or more angry since the trade happened? If you're the Padres, are you less happy, as happy, or happier that you made the trade? It's too early. We don't know yet. I do not, as a baseball executive, allow myself to have recency bias. And that is what everybody is having. That's why I'm not taking a victory lap because I told you that the Brewers fleece the Padres. Haters, ERA of 25 doesn't matter to me. If he had had a perfect ERA and had not given up a run and is the lockdown closer, I'm not evaluating until I know what happens to the Brewers going forward, how they reallocate his money, what happens to the two young players they got. Don't tell me that Donaldson Lamette was released by the Brewers and then is signed and pitching somewhere else. Who cares? This was a trade about reallocating your payroll. Players make more money as they get older in the arbitration system. You've got to get rid of them and get younger players, and the place to do it is the bullpen, for sure. And when you've got a replacement, you've got to move when it's early, not late. I was the king of selling low and buying high. That made me bad. If you can buy low and sell high, you're good, but unpopular. I was bad and unpopular. God, that's the worst quadrant of all, Like, right? There's four quadrants. You can be bad and unpopular. You can be bad and popular. You can be good and unpopular, or you can be good and popular. I'd rather be good and popular. That's one quadrant. I certainly don't want to be bad and unpopular. That's the worst one. I'd rather be popular and then hopefully be good. It's all about popular. That's a great song from Wicked, by the way. So my revisit of the hater trade is that I'm not revisiting it. So all of you who are talking about the hater trade, stop. It is too early. But boy, does he stink. And I think I said Trevor Rogers. I don't know if that's who I meant. I always get confused between Trevor Rogers and Trevor Rosenthal. I'm not sure who it is. Who is it that was traded from, who was traded from the Padres, Coca? Do you remember? Anyway, let me know if you can. Nothing personal pick of the day. We haven't had a one and two weekend in a while. Friday was an easy one. Dodgers over the Marlins. That was a win. It is Trevor Rogers. Oh, he's the Marlins guy. That's why I was confused. It was Trevor Rosenthal who was traded to the Brewers who's hurt. Saturday, we had the Blue Jays beating the Angels. People in Toronto, and I, I love Canada. You know that I love you all in Toronto. You know how much time I spend doing radio shows, including today, by the way. But I will only say this. When I picked the Blue Jays, they seemed to lose every single time. And they lost Saturday. Sunday, Taylor Rogers. <laughs> All right, Coca. Let's, let's make this much cleaner. Ready? 469. Taylor Rogers was traded to the Brewers by the Padres. He is out for the season and he's hurt. Or is Trevor Rosenthal hurt? I, my mind is blown right now. So just eliminate the entire segment. Let's not even talk about who went back from the Padres to the Brewers and whether or not he's hurt. <sighs> Wait, Taylor and Trevor Rogers are twins? Okay. Whatever. Who's hurt? Nope, no one's hurt. Okay. That's the end of that. We are live. Okay. <laughs> Wait, Coca, I don't understand what you're saying. Folks, this is how it works. Coca's talking to me and he's writing stuff down. And what he's saying to me is different than what he's writing down. And I'm trying to also talk about stuff. I'm doing three things at once. And my mind is on whether or not the storage company is going to deliver my son's stuff on the early side of the window versus the late side of the window so I can get out of here. They give you like a four hour window. So what am I gonna, I'm gonna sit in his dorm room for four hours? Hey, when's the fridge coming? Hey, how many more times can I go to bed, bath and fricking beyond? God, I better find Will Ferrell there. Try to work in three bed, bath and beyond runs. Hey, do you mind if I ask your roommate if he can give me a rip? It's about the only way I'm gonna get through today. Sunday, we had Syndergaard beating the Pirates. The Pirates are the worst team in baseball to me, and they beat the Phillies. So we're one and two. 
We're 92 and 75. Remember when Carlos Rodon signed with the Giants? And everyone said, what, San Francisco Giants, they won their division last year. They won 107 games. And I told you they got career years out of everyone. And everyone said, they're going to be good. And I said, they're not good. You can't have back-to-back career years by six guys. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Rodon's been a great sign for them. Giants are below 500. No chance of making the playoffs. They're exactly where we thought they'd be. But they're playing the Padres. I think I'm going to go against the Padres every day for the rest of the year. The Padres' offense is meek. Having Juan Soto, he's, he did well. I think he had a home run the other day. So I think he's up to three home runs since the trade. They're great. Rodon and the Giants over the Padres. Wait to see is when we tell you something's going to happen. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes it doesn't. We revisit it. Do you remember what happened on 8-26 of 22? Way back on Friday. Back before Julio Rodriguez signed his deal. Back before Major League Baseball players in the minor leagues wanted to join their union. We talked about Matt Ariza. Matt Ariza is the punter for the Bills who is being sued civilly by a girl who was 17 saying that she was gang raped in school. Since then, Ariza has not been with the team. And I said, they're going to release him. Like, you do not mess around with this. He's a punter. This is when I tell you that when you are a good player in a quality position, you get the benefit of 17 doubts. When you're a punter, you don't. When you're Deshaun Watson, you can have 69 lawsuits. And guess what? We want you. We want to give you the most money ever. When you're a punter, oh, my God, he had an 82-yard punt. Remember that in preseason? There was this guy who had an 82-yard punt. This guy's got the leg of a Marvel character. Guess what? The Bills released him. We got that one right. It's pretty easy, isn't it? Last year, we had a wait to see about the Boston Red Sox player named Sayumara telling you that he was not going to be there in September. I was off by a year. The Red Sox are getting rid of him now. God, do they stink. We lost that way to see. I took the loss, but I would have had the win if I had just said September of 22, not September of 21. I also had to wait to see about Tyler Glasnow. That's a pitcher for the Tampa Bay Rays. There's a contract that he signed this weekend that was interesting, so I want to teach you about it. It's very weird when a player signs a two-year, $30 million contract, and the payments are five one year and 25 the next year. Hmm. Why would you do that? That's sort of a weird split. That's backloading in a way that's very bizarre. Tyler Glass now is going to become a free agent in 2023, but he's out for the season with Tommy John surgery, and I told you on August 3rd of last year, over a year ago, when he first got hurt, I said, wait to see, he is going to delay his free agency. Guess what the Tampa Bay Rays did yesterday? They delayed his free agency and he accepted. He's getting $5 million to continue his rehab, and then the Rays are giving him $25 million the year he comes back. When Tyler Glasnow was healthy, and if he comes back from Tommy John and is the pitcher he was, he'd get more than $25 million and more than one year in free agency. But there's always a chance from Tyler Glasnow's standpoint, what if I never make it back? What if my elbow falls apart during rehab? What if I'm just not the same guy? I'm going to get $25 million for one year. That's more than I'd ever get. So I've got $12.5 million net. Listen, more than most, less than few, I'm taking it. Tyler Glasnow signing that contract makes perfect sense. That started with uh, we were never able to do it. I learned about doing those deals. I believe the Dodgers did those when when uh, were the first team to start doing that because they had so much money that they could afford to take the risk. And I remember talking to our owner, Jeffrey Loria, and Larry Beinfest and Mike Hill about that, the president of baseball operations for the team, saying, why would we do this? Because if he does recover, then we're going to lose him but we'll, we got to find someone else because if he doesn't recover, then we've just lost $10 million back then. It wouldn't be 25 or $15 million or $8 million, whatever the case was. The numbers were smaller 10 or 15 years ago, but the sort of percentage was the same. A pitcher like Tyler Glasnow for $25 million, that is sort of the same as when, it, for me, it was 10 But the point is there aren't many teams who can take the risk, but now – The Tampa Bay Rays are taking that risk, which means the industry realizes that salaries are so high for top-end pitchers 
that no matter what the number is, you make that deal. Because the Tampa Bay Rays can never sign Tyler Glasnow, a healthy Tyler Glasnow, to a free agent deal. They can't sign a Max Scherzer. They can't, they're not in the Jacob DeGrom sweepstakes, right? They've got to grow their own, and then they've got to let him go. But if you can get an extra year before you have to let that player go, you're going to do it. You'd always rather pay more for one year. And if you're wrong, it's a one-year mistake, and you can rebound the next year. If you're wrong on a multi-year deal, like with Julio Rodriguez or Louis Robert or any Rodney Castillo, any of the young players who are getting all this guaranteed money, or if you're wrong on a free agent deal and you are not the Dodgers or the Yankees, that impacts your operation going forward. My wait to see today, do I have a wait to see? Did I do a wait to see? I'm out of time. I thought I had a wait to see earlier in the show. I think we may have skipped it. Did we have a wait to see at Coca? Oh, it's Paul Goldschmidt. Have you been following Paul Goldschmidt of the Cardinals? Everyone is saying he could be the first guy to win a Triple Crown since Miguel Cabrera. He's right up there with Schwarber in home runs, Pete Alonso in RBI. His average, he's, gonna, he's very likely to win the batting title. There's a full month left to go. I was going to do a whole segment on the Cardinals. I'll do that segment another time, I think, but I'll give you my wait to see today just so we can book it for August 29th, 2022. Paul Goldschmidt will not win the Triple Crown. It is so hard to do what Miguel Cabrera did, I can't even tell you. I mean, you know, because no one ever wins the Triple Crown. It's impossible. So I don't see Paul Goldschmidt doing it. While he will win the MVP, just not the Triple Crown. All right, that's it. I think we're over time. Thank you for giving me not just 45, but 46 minutes of your life. In return, I'll be back tomorrow. It's just business. This is nothing personal. 